I'd like to introduce you to Barry Gamble, who is a highly experienced chair and non-exec. And uh, Barry is currently the chairman of um, the NED uh, City, De City Debates, and he's also a senior advisor to the Non-Executive Directors Association, so has got an awful lot of experience. Now, one of the questions I wanted to ask Barry, and I sort of thought it was quite a simple question, what type of boards are there out there? Gosh, well, a board, let's start off. I mean, a board is, is one of several names um, which is used to uh, signify a group of res people responsible for governing a company or organisation. Um, and depending on the legal form, um, uh, the, these might be trustees, governors, directors, non-executives. Um, they, they might... Um, they might be serving on a board of directors, a board of trustees, a governing council. Um, there's a whole host of uh, descriptions for the, 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 the role itself and for the, the board or entity on which they sit. But these different boards require different skills and aptitudes. So I think as if anyone is contemplating wanting to go on a board, um, it's quite useful to have some sense as to the different types of organization you, you may come across. Um, I mean, perhaps if I could just start off, Heather, I mean, you, you can start off perhaps with a limited liability company, which is the one that most would have come across, probably, you know, privately owned and perhaps just set up and established by a founder. So a founder led organization. If something of that type is fast growing, um, and a developing business, then it, it might be further described as entrepreneurial. I mean, it's, it's a very loose definition, but I think we all know what that might look like. And if the company then goes on to have outside shareholders, um, these might be family members, or they could be close third parties, perhaps private equity or venture capital. Um, and some early stage businesses might have external shareholder increasing you now through perhaps crowdfunding um, or, or agent investors. All of these have an impact on uh, how that board operates um, and the role of someone uh, when they take uh, a position on, on one of those boards. Um, and, and just to sort of complete that list, um, we could probably also add in some uh, businesses that are organized as, as partner, partnerships, so limited liability partnerships, perhaps. So there's a, and those are sort of a, an example of the range of structures that we might come across. You touched in the, on the introduction of my experience on the public markets. And so if a company then is uh, perhaps on a public London Stock Exchange or another exchange, then it's, it's described as listed, or it could be on London's alternative investment market, the junior market. Um, and then you've got a whole host of issues come into play because the role of the directors is to a degree um, constrained um, and prescribed perhaps more by the regulatory background. So you come across regulators have some impact on this. Uh, it could be the London Stock Exchange, it could be the AIM team, it could be the Financial Conduct Authority, um, it could be the uh, Financial Reporting Council. There's a whole host of ones which can really have an impact on how those um, how those boards operate and, and the feel of them. So there's a sort of a range in terms of the private into the, uh, the then the public sector. But then if you go into public sector entities as such, um, the boards you know, could include government or or local authorities, um, NHS trusts, um, regulatory boards. I mean, increasingly, enough, a lot of those would be associated perhaps with a particular trade uh, or sector. Um, and then we can move into probably um, oversight, statutory bodies, which there are many there, um, sort of arms of governments, where um, increasingly they look to operate with non-executives involved. And then, of course, there's a, there's a further group beyond that i think we can identify uh, the not-for-profit uh, the charitable sector and that takes in a whole swathe from the small local charity through to some very substantial uh, national and international charity it takes in the educational sector schools universities um, whether they be in the public sector as such or whether those are privately 
privately run and operated. Um, there's opportunities in all those, all that area of education, and a lot of demand really for good governors. Governors are prepared to give time and um, offer their experience in, in those situations. Um, and again, those will all probably be regulated by the Charity Commission. Um, they may or may not be a limited company. There's a whole host of different types of legal structures that can apply. But I think I've totted that list up, Heather, and there's probably 20 or more even of different types of organisations. And it's just quite important for anyone contemplating going on those boards to understand um, how they're structured, how they're organised, what are the rules and regulations that impact on them, because that will have quite a, uh, an effect on how they, will, how they operate, and as I say, the feel of them as well for the individual coming to them. The other thing that does vary and affects quite a lot about how these boards operate is, of course, the size of them, and they vary quite a lot. Um, I mean, best regulatory practice for public companies has shifted, um, prompted by the regulators as such, to have a, um, a majority of non-executive over executive directors. So that has an impact in terms of the overall size. Um, if you're then trying to um, pursue uh, more of a policy of uh, having diversity on your board, trying to get a good mix of candidates coming through, that can actually create quite significant challenges in terms of the size of the boards. Um, it can mean that you're shifting towards you know, a, a larger type entity. But smaller companies, uh, local charities, private companies, you know, probably say a board of four to six, maybe perhaps sometimes a little bit larger than that would be what you typically see. Um, eight to 12 would probably encompass the size of a lot of boards, but it wouldn't be at all unusual on um, larger corporations, whether they be private, public or larger charities that you might have 15 to 20 on a board. Um, so there's quite a variation there in, in the size. And again, the impact, I think, if you're non-executive, you would necessarily have. Um, in addition to those main board responsibilities, there will be opportunities to serve on uh, the subcommittees and boards. So typically audit, audit and risk is often combined, nominations, uh, the responsibility for uh, board succession and planning new board, new board members. Um, remuneration, um, that's always an interesting contentious one, deciding and, and recommending on the um, remuneration of the chief executive and other senior executives. Um, all of those will need to be chaired, so there's yet further opportunity to develop that skill set. There's one other type of board that I might mention though, that is a little bit around the edges that might provide some really interesting opportunities for people who are contemplating their first role, and that's the advisory board. Um, and whether it's you know, an advisory board, an advisory committee, whether they're drawn up for a particular purpose or a particular time scale, however they interact with the board, that's a terrific opportunity um, to have the experience of understanding how a board operates, perhaps an interface with the main board, and probably an opportunity just to develop some skills and you might well find then you get invited to uh, so, so on the main board. So don't forget advisory boards. They're, they're, they're drawn up, they're constituted in all sorts of uh, different ways, but uh, I would certainly put them on the list. Um, but let me just hope anyway, Heather, that's given you and um, your, your followers here a, a, a bit more of a feeling as to the range of opportunities that are out there if they're contemplating going on a board. Um, there's lots of different types of boards. There's all sorts of different ways in which they could interface with them. Uh, I and mean, I think um, an opportunity for everyone to frame um, their uh, ambition in, in line with the sort of a very, very wild, wide field of, of opportunity here. So I hope that sort of gives you a little bit of a flavour of this area. I think that's really interesting. And uh, most importantly, what it enables everyone to do is to research quite thoroughly um, what type of board would best suit them at this particular stage of their career. So Barry, thank you very much indeed. I love the summary. I think it was really succinct um, and again, very practical for everyone. So thank you very much. Great pleasure, Helen. So whilst my question was quite a simple one, what type of boards are out there? 
what it leaves us with is um, quite a complex um, picture in terms of the types of boards that could be really useful and practical for you. So I'm going to leave you with four questions you might want to consider for yourself when it comes to what type of board is best for you. So what sort of board out of the ones that Barry listed uh, appeals to you the most? Where do you think your current skills could be best served and placed when it comes to being on a board? you are probably gathered that depending on your point of entry, as in your skills and expertise, your knowledge about boards might also dictate what type of board would best suit you as well. And then finally, it might leave you with a question. What experiences do you need to gain in order to help best position you on the board that you would like to get onto next?